morning. bow our hearts, we bend our knees, oh Spirit come make us humble, we turn our eyes from evil things, oh Lord we cast down So give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to another. Oh God, let us be. A generation that seeks, who seeks your face, oh God of Jacob. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, who seeks your face.
bow our hearts we bend our knees oh spirit come make us humble we turn our eyes from evil things oh lord we cast down So give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to another. So give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to another. Oh God, let us be. A generation that seeks, who seeks your face, O oh God of Jacob. O oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, who seeks your face, O oh God of Jacob. So give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to now. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, who seeks your face, oh God. came 
from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My dead to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. seated. When the stars burned down and the earth was out and we stand before the throne with the witnesses who have gone before we will rise and all applaud singing blessing and honor and glory and power forever to our God singing blessing and honor When the hands of time wind fully down And the earth is rolled up like a scroll The trumpets will call and the world will fall To its knees as we go home Singing blessing and honor and glory and power Forever to our God Singing blessing and honor In a moment we will be like him He will wipe our eyes dry Take us up to his side And forever we will be his Singing blessing and honor and glory
Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of when fears are still and striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in help is made. This gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live Stand for the last song. At your name. The mountain shake and crumble At your name The oceans roar and tumble At your name the Angels will bow The earth will rejoice Your people cry out Lord of all the earth We shout your name, shout your name Filling up the skies with endless praise Shout your name, O oh Lord. At your name, 
the morning breaks and glory at your name creation sings your story at your name angels will bow the earth will rejoice your people cry out Lord of all the earth we shout your name shout your name filling up the skies with endless praise God, we will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing, we will sing. There's no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing. There's no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing, we will sing. There's no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing. Shout your name, oh Lord. One more time. Lord of all the earth, shout your name, shout your name. Filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Now we away. We love to shout your name, oh Lord. Shout it. Yahweh, your name means the becoming one, which means that you become to us whatever we need. Yahweh, Jireh, you become our provider. When we are in times of stress, when we need some things that we can't afford, you'll make a way for us to get those things that we need, not necessarily the things we want, <laughs> but the things that we need. Yahweh Nissi, you are our banner, our protection. When we feel threatened, when we feel insecure, when we watch the news and we want to crawl up and go into our closet and close the door forever, you are our protection. You will watch over us. When we are anxious, when we are stressed, you are Yahweh Shalom, our peace. You are our peace. When we are in a mess, when we're addicted to drugs or when we're in a all kinds of different things that we can get involved in. I won't mention them because they're so gross. But, Lord, you are our salvation. Yahweh Shua, Jesus, our salvation. And lastly, you are our righteousness. You wrap us in your righteousness. We can't do it on our own. You wrap us in your righteousness. Yahweh Tzit canoe. And now who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless, Faultless before the throne of God with exceeding joy. To him be all honor and praise and glory forever. Amen. 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 Well, good morning and welcome. Uh, let's take a minute and greet one another, and then we will start the message shortly. Thank you and good morning. Hope everyone is being blessed. Am I on at all out there now, Andy? Check, check, check. Oh, there we go. All right, if we can make our way back to our seats, please. We'll get started here this morning. Very blessed to see everyone. Uh, we made it back from the men's retreat, and uh, thank God for that. Uh, thank you to Eric, Purdy, and Nathan, and Jim, and uh, the guys that came out, but them specifically for the teaching, for the worship, uh, and Jim for all the targets and the arsenal. And um, the theme was fellowship. And, you know, I think God was testing our, our, our iron, so to speak, with our fellowship with one another because we had some snags. And, um, you know, I always enjoy not the snags when you're going through them, but seeing what comes of those snags. And, you know, sometimes uh, in this world and, and we as men, you know, things don't always go exactly the way we plan them to. But you know, you really begin to see what comes of the difficulty and the struggle. It's not always pretty, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, we are learning and growing to be men of God together and brothers. And um, so I thought it was blessed. Uh, the teaching was, was, was great. I thought the theme was good. 
And um, so looking forward to um, doing that again uh, next year. So uh, if you brought your Bible with you here this morning and you'd like to open it with me, we are in Ephesians 5, and this is probably going to be a three-part uh, study that I'm including the last week with. Um, and then we're going to talk about um, the role here in, in the marriage as Paul's uh, defining for us the Christ-like marriage and how important it is for us as Christians to understand God's mission, I like this, God's mission for the man and the wife in the marriage, which also includes the kids. And also, he's going to speak, uh, we'll look at in two weeks, uh, to employee and employers. And so a very powerful portion of Scripture, very hotly contested and debated, and we're going to uncover some stones here that may make everyone feel a little uncomfortable, and, and I'm okay with that, uh, because I was uncomfortable studying through this, but I think God usually desires to make His people uncomfortable at times. Because God's Word, what we find here, is that God's Word usually is very abrasive to my human nature. <laughs> uh, the things that God desires usually aren't the things that I desire, though in His Word I find a lot of things that I agree with. But there are those things in His Word that I have a hard time agreeing with. But at the end of the day, as Christians, I submit myself to God's authority. I don't understand everything. I'm not asked to understand everything, but I understand enough of God and my position as His child and as His creation that I have willfully submitted myself to His authority. And so this idea and concept of authority, remember, starts with our submission to God. Each and every one of us, when we came to faith in Jesus Christ and we did what? We bowed our knee which really is a picture of us bowing our hearts before God and saying, as our Lord and Savior said, it's no longer my will. I've had enough of my will, of my way. I found it to be empty. I found myself to be more wanting. I found maybe my marriage to begin to struggle. I found my job situation maybe to struggle. Uh, I've come to the place to say, I don't want to do it my way anymore. God, I am now giving you control. I am now taking your word as my truth. I am now becoming a Christian. I submit myself to you. And really, the life of the Christian is so contrary to the life that we once lived as non-Christians because I've said it before, and I'll say it again, my life before Christ, I was very rebellious. You tell me something to do, and I would do the complete opposite just because that was my nature. I wanted to do things my way, and nobody was going to tell me not to. And so for me, understanding this submission to God, really the, the life of the Christian is about submission. It's very unpopular to say in today's age, and we're going to look a little bit more at that, because there are limits to submission. But as I began to develop last week, as Christians, we have to be very careful where we determine those lines to be. Where we put our limits on our submission. Well, how much am I supposed to really give of myself to somebody else? Well, I think in this context and in this picture of the husband and the wife in the marriage, what we see is that there really aren't limits on the submission. God isn't putting limits on our submission. God is giving us an example of what our attitude of submission should be. We as humans, men, we'll see as husbands and wives, and we'll see as wives, we determine the limits of the submission according to our gender, according to our role. Wives, in their natural sense, before they're Christians, will always try to test the line of submission in the marriage to the husband, to her husband, by saying, I want less limits on the submission I'm supposed to submit to my husband. Whereas the men, in their natural sense, not Christians, are looking to have more submission. There's more things that you need to do my way and you need to do less. See, we put limits on the submission. 
Here, what God is going to show us is that God isn't putting limits on those submission. We do, and rightfully sometimes, we do need to put limits on submission. But understand this in the truest sense. When we give ourselves to God, do we just give part of our submission to God? Well, God, I'll submit to you in the things that I agree with in your word, but the things I disagree with, I'm not going to submit to those, but I'm going to still try to uh, under, uh, submit myself under your authority and, and call myself a Christian under your authority, but really what am I doing? I'm dividing my heart. So understand that. God's limit to submission to him is we're to have given him our very lives. That we are now no longer possessing our own lives. That the life that we now have in Christ has been given to us. It is a new gift. That our lives have been bought. That we are no longer ourselves. So God doesn't really put limits on submission, but we do. And so I'm going to try to develop this because I think it's profound in today's age. Christians submitting to their government authorities are their lines. Well, our generation has been blessed enough to see a time where the church has had to take huge stands that they have not taken in decades, especially in this country, has taken stands to do what? To not submit to those authorities because we believe that they were outreaching their grasp, that they were trying to assume more authority than had been given to them by God. And so the church has made some radical decisions. And as I tried to develop last week, my fear is that we have to be careful that we don't begin to have this appetite of rebellion. That that limit now where we have made is our limit of the things that we will submit to and we won't. Well, what's to keep that limit from expanding? That's the danger. That's the danger. And so I think we see a beautiful picture of this even in the marriage Because everything comes from the marriage, really. God's way. God's first plan for man was to have a wife. That is God's first plan for all of us. Before career, before babies. Right? How cute. Little girls grow up to be desiring to be mommies. Most little girls. Not all of them. But God's original plan for man and woman is marriage. God said it wasn't good for the man to be alone, so he created the woman. And so how fitting that how God orders the marriage now applies to how our jobs, how we interact with our employers, how we interact in our community towards governing authorities above us. It all comes from our home. How we respond to God's order in the home is directly related to how we respond to authorities outside of the home. I'll give you a quick example before we pray. This is going to be a long message. If a child doesn't understand authority in the home, again, remember limits. There are limits. I'm not talking about abusing children. I'm talking about disciplining a child. If a child doesn't respect the authority of the parent, the child will never respect the authority of a police officer. Will never respect the authority of a pastor or anyone, their employer. And that's my point, is this idea of submission being under the mission. I love that, perfect definition of submission putting yourself under the mission that comes from that word sub under mission putting yourself under the mission not making yourself a dodo bird it's not speaking of you just being silent and not saying anything and just take it that is not submission we talked about that at the men's retreat it's putting yourself under the mission And when we put ourselves under the mission, it will be the best recipe, God's recipe, for success. For a fruitful marriage, for a fruitful family, for the best environment for kids to be raised, to find their identity in Christ, to grow and mature, and to see the pursuit of happiness, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To live out their God-given dream and their abilities. It's, It's when the family is functioning the way God has ordered it to function. And it's all about 
submission, dying to ourselves. And so let's pray, and we'll get into this. We may not get past the first verse or two. So if I go over an hour, just kind of start raising your hand, even though I have a clock here. Let's pray, and we'll get into this study here this morning. Father, I just thank you already for the work you're doing, Lord, and just the preparation, God. And I thank you for Toby and the wonderful time of worship. And truly, God, that is what we're here to do. This isn't my soapbox, and I don't want it to be a soapbox, but God, this is worshiping you, worshiping your truth and your word. And Lord, I believe we're here because we want to worship you, because you are a good God, because you are a life-changing God. Because, God, you have taken us from death and you have made us alive. Lord, you have taken slaves and you've made us free. And so, God, as you continue to transform us by the renewing of our mind, I pray, God, that you would minister to us here today. As we have submitted our lives to you, Jesus, there's nothing that we have held back from you. We've committed it all to you. Not because you are a harsh taskmaster. It's not out of fear that I did this. It's out of love. Because your word says that true love casts out fear. I didn't love you because I was afraid of you. I have reverence and respect for you, but it's the great love that you have shown for me. No greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So, Father, we submit ourselves to a loving, good God. And, Lord, we just pray that you would minister to us here today and Lord, we know that this passage, Lord, is going to be difficult at times, so uh, give us grace, God. Help us to remember the heart behind this. It's the heart of submission. It's the heart of dying to ourselves and actually loving someone else more or as much as I love myself. Nobody has to teach me how to love myself. Oh, I know how to love myself. What I need to learn is how to not love myself so much and to love others, God. And that's what it is. That's what submission is. It's loving someone else, giving my way for someone else. And so, Father, that is the life of the Christian. So minister to us here this morning. Bless the marriages before God. Bless the husbands. Bless the wives. Bless the kids. Lord, minister to us as we understand your idea for the marriage. And so bless all that goes on here. We love you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we're going to begin here, Ephesians 5, beginning at verse 20. It says, Always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject, there's that word, be submissive, to one another in Christ, in the fear of Christ. Verse 22, wives, be subject or submissive to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is submissive or in subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, and that he might present to himself the church in all of her glory having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, amen. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined, underline that, joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself, and the wife see to it that she respects her husband." 
And so understand, Paul here is talking to Christians. He's talking to married couples. And so the first thing in reading this text, we have to understand is that a Christian marriage is different than a secular marriage. We are looking at a Christian marriage. And if we are Christians, then this is the model that God has given for the Christian woman and the Christian man or the Christian husband and the Christian, Christian wife. This is the order and this is the way that God has designed the marriage. Now remember I included verse 21 before we got into the verse 22 that is very hotly contested. Remember verse 21, Paul makes it very clear that as Christians, individuals, men and women, that we are to be submissive to one another. That as Christians, we are to not be thoughtless of others. When we submit to one another, we are thinking of others. That's what he's talking about. So as individuals, before you're married, when you're a girl or a woman and a man, before your husband and wife, you as Christians are already learning and understanding this idea of submission to one another. That you are holding others in higher preference than yourself. That's what love does. Christians not being so self-centered. Well, you're never going to get married if you're self-centered. And if you are and you do, you're going to find out real quick that marriage is God's way of, of being like an abrasive sandpaper, right? To teach you that you don't always get what you want. <laughs> Both of us. We have to learn how to live together as one body. I remember my wife, one of her big pet peeves when we first got married was something that I was so used to doing as a bachelor and that was just throwing my dirty clothes in the corner. Well, that, guess what? When I got married, that didn't work. She's like, there's a wastebasket right there, a, a hamper. Put your clothes in the hamper, right? I have to learn to now exist with this woman that I love who does things differently than I do. But what does love do? Well, love thinks of her. I didn't say, ah, forget you. I'm going to just throw them that way. Well, it would have been a lot of problems. But what did I do? Not out of fear, out of my thought for her and my love for her, I said, you know what? What's the big deal? If I throw them over there, if I throw them over there, how about I just throw them over there? You see, that's what love begins to do. It thinks of others. It's not so self-centered. Uh, it teaches us when we submit one to another, as I talked about last week, it teaches us this concept of a unit. It teaches us this concept of a team. That it's no longer just about you, it's about you and your team. That you as an individual are no longer more important than the team. In the marriage, right? The husband isn't more important than the wife, and the wife isn't more important than the husband. The unit is what is more important. Understanding the team or the body becoming one. It's no longer about him and her, it's them. It's us, it's we. There is no I in team. If there is, you're going to have a rocky marriage that probably will end in divorce unless you do what? You humble yourself, you submit yourself to God, you understand what marriage really is and what love really is. It's not about somebody basking you and making you feel special and, and giving and giving to you. No, love is actually giving of yourself to someone else, both husband and wife. Christians are happy when others succeed. If you're in a marriage where you hate when your husband does something good or your husband, you think you hate it when your wife does something good, I'd say there's a problem in that marriage. When you want to see your wife fail or not succeed or vice versa, why? Well, because when we are subject to one another, we want the best for one another. <laughs> if you don't want the best for your wife, you need to see me after church. Wives, if you don't want your husbands to succeed, then you need to see me after church, together hopefully. 
Because this is what it's talking about, being in subject to one another. It starts before you're married. You know, I didn't wear, marry my wife. I'm going to say this in lieu of verse 22. Because we're going to look at two sides. It's funny how men have one interpretation a lot of times and women have a whole different interpretation. But let me state this. If you are a man, and I've seen this in counseling, marriage counseling, where the man says, well, if my wife would just submit to me as under the Lord, everything would be fine. And what I often say to them is, as I said, is that why you married your wife? Did you marry your wife expecting her to submit to everything you want? Somehow that you're like the king and she's some subservient, obedient, thoughtless, mouthless woman that's just supposed to do as you say? Well, then you got married with a very extraordinary misconception. When I got married, I didn't, the first thing when I saw my beautiful wife, I didn't say, man, I can't wait for her to submit to me and everything, you know, that I say and do. First, I was attracted to a female. My wife was beautiful. That kind of what drew me to talk to her. But then through meeting her and talking to her, I found that she actually was smart. I love the idea that she was smart. She was so considerate. I was kind of an inconsiderate guy. It was kind of all about me, myself, and I. I was amazed at how considerate my wife was, how much she loved her family, her mom and her dad, the things she did for her mom and her dad, working two jobs because they were struggling, and he got hurt at home, and he was off of work. So she went and she gave of herself with two jobs to help her mom and dad. You know, I fell in love with my wife because of who she was. And I thought to myself, you know, I love her and I want to know more about her. I'm looking for a partner in life. I'm looking for a co-heir, somebody to share this life with, somebody to make happy. Because I found great pleasure in doing things for her and seeing her light up and, and then love me all the more. So let's not forget why we got married in the first place. The, the couples who are in trouble always go to this verse. And I see it because I'm a pastor. And, and don't, let me de don't let that deter you. If your marriage is in trouble, I'm not condemning it. I have answers for it, though. One of the first answers is, is, why did you marry her? If you married her because it's her job to submit to you, then you married her for the wrong reasons. You have a misunderstanding of the Scripture you love her. She loves you. She is what? In Christ, submitting herself to one another. She's thinking of others. And so I love this because Paul says now, after loving and submitting yourself to one another, that's a very general, broad statement. Now what is he doing here in verse 22? Well, he's getting into specifics. But it's the same concept. It's submission. It's putting yourself under the mission. And so he says in verse 22, Wives, be subject or submissive to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, I had a couple who I was doing marriage counseling and... <laughs> The husband went right to that verse. All the problems in our marriage are because she doesn't submit to me. If she just submitted to me as unto the Lord, then our marriage would be fine. And I'm like, you know, first of all, I'm not stupid. Second of all, I've been married for 17 years, known my wife for 19 years. So, you, you know, you can't get me to jump on your bandwagon with that statement. But then the wife, I found it amazing. She turned to me and she says, you know what? I know a man wrote this portion of Scripture. <laughs> and I said, you're right. A man did write it. Paul wrote it. But don't forget, Paul was inspired by God when he wrote it. But here was her thinking behind it. And part of it was she was being kind of joking, but part of it was she was pretty serious. She said, why did... Paul mentioned the submission of the wife before he mentioned 
the husband loving his wife as Christ loved the church. So is Paul saying right out the gate that any problem with the marriage is because the wife isn't submitting to the husband? Because Paul mentioned it first here. See, it's a man who wrote this book. Not identifying his part of the problem, but blaming the wife first. Isn't the man good about blaming the wife first? Go back to Adam and Eve. Right? Who was it that sinned? Eve. Did that absolve the man of the sin who was supposed to be responsible for his wife? Oh, we're not even to the men yet, and I'm already getting there. But then God went to who? Did he go to Eve and say, Eve? No, he went to the man. Interesting. Why? Because the man is superior over the woman? No, we're going to get there. The man's responsible, ladies. The man is going to be accountable for how he treats you. Ouch. He went to Adam. And what did Adam do? She did it. She made me do it. It's her fault. Right? So that's where the woman was coming from. See, it's the same old Adam thing right here. Paul's doing the same thing now. No, let's, let's look at this. What is Paul talking about? The verse prior, submission. So the natural order of things is he's talking to the submission part. He says, wives, submit to your husbands, just like he identifies in the next couple verses the kids before the parents. He says, children, why? Because they're the ones that need to do what? Submit to your parents as unto the Lord. How about slaves or workers? Workers, submit to your employers. So be careful. Be careful when we're coming to this. That's why I said this chauvinistic side of the Bible. The Bible's not chauvinistic. God is not chauvinistic. It says, wives, submit to your own husbands. Now, something this does not say. It doesn't say women submit to men. Shucks. What does it say? Wives, submit to men. No, it didn't say that, did it? It said, wives, submit to your own husband. Paul's saying, remember, ladies, that you weren't coerced into the marriage with your husband. If you were, that's a problem. You chose your husband. You said, I do. You committed yourself to him. In fact, in this day and age, the woman still takes the man's name. You give yourself to your husband, do you not? So Paul says here, since you have chosen your husband, and if nothing else, ladies, if you're single here today or you're divorced, here's a good, good comment for you. Knowing this and reading through this, be careful how you choose your husband. May I say, choose a husband that you can respect because God is going to command you as wives to be submissive to your husband. So then maybe you better do a better job of choosing Romeo. Don't choose Romeo because he's got a lot of money. You see, you think a lot of people in the world get married for the wrong reasons. A woman who just wants to always, you know, be dressed to the nines and drive the nice car and have the big house, well, she's going to need a man with a lot of money. So maybe she says, well, he kind of treats women bad and he does all these things, but you know what, he's got a lot of money, so we'll just go with him. Wrong. Or the guy that says, ooh, man, look at her, drop dead, just, uh, she's hot. Yeah, well, you know, she's kind of, mean and cruel and always sliding people and this and that, but she looks good. Well, you're getting married for foolish reasons. Foolish. So if nothing else here, understand that you better be more selective about who you're choosing to marry because you're giving yourself to him. So it says, wives, submit yourself to your own husbands. And here's the most hotly contested part. You can't dance around what Paul just said. He said, wives, submit to your own husbands. That's black and white. Here's the part where the contention lies. Because what do we like to do? Well, we like to put limits on things. So there's usually two main arguments to this 
as unto the Lord, right? Submit, wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Let me give you the two most popular misinterpretations of what this scripture is saying. Wives, be submissive to your own husbands, can't get around that. But what about the as unto the Lord? Well, you see, men can tend to read this verse and say, as the woman submits to God, which we very clearly said, as Christians, we submit our whole selves to God. There should be no limits to which we submit ourselves to God. So the first misinterpretation is on the man's part, who says, the way that the woman submits to God, she now needs to submit to me. So what it's saying is, there are no limits, women. If I say it, you do it. Why? Because that's really, as Christians, what we do to God. You say it, and I do it, God. So men will say that. Just whatever I say, you do it, and, you know, it doesn't matter what you say or think or do. So what is the man doing? He's making that command. He's making the woman's submission. He's making himself God. He's saying, you submit to me like I'm God. So maybe he may interpret it and read it like this. Wives, be submissive to your own husbands as I am the Lord. Last time I checked, that's not what it says. As to the Lord is not speaking of, listen to this, it's not speaking of the extent to which the woman is to submit. You see, this is a wrong interpretation. The idea is not to submit to the man as you would to God. You see, a lot of men will use the scripture we're going to look at later in 1 Peter. When Peter actually blesses Sarah, remember Abraham's wife, and Peter actually says these words that says, you know, he's, he's encouraging the women who maybe don't have the best of husbands, who aren't loving them like Christ loved the church. And Peter didn't say, kick him out, he's a bum. Peter actually said, with your good behavior... You know, not adorning yourself, not worrying about vanity and these sorts of things, but being a quiet, humble, gentle, loving wife, you could actually win your husband to Christ. Women, you know, we like to admit, or you like to admit that part, maybe. And Peter goes so far, he even says, just like Sarah, who did what? Subjected to, where, where's it at? I don't have it now. It says, um... That Sarah called Abraham Lord. See, men say, oh, see, Sarah called Abraham Lord. So Paul is following that up by saying, uh, wives, submit to your husbands as he is the Lord. Well, that is not what Abraham and Sarah, that's not what the Bible is talking about. That's not even what Peter was talking about. She wasn't calling Abraham Lord like he's God. It's a term of respect. And so really, this is what Paul's saying. In fact, he says it in the later verses of Ephesians. Wives, respect your husbands. So Peter is commending Sarah for her behavior and that she was respecting her husband. She's not calling him Lord and being some little punching bag. If you think your idea of being Lord is the caveman who goes and grabs his girl and throws her up over the shoulder and hauls her off to the cave and throws her in the cave and demands that she cooks and she cleans and she does all of this and just shut up. That is not what is going on here. It's not wives submit yourself to your husbands as he's the Lord. No, but it is saying women, wives, should respect their husbands. So what are some of these limits? Is there a limit to a woman's submission to her husband, her own husband, as unto the Lord? 
Are there limits? Well, let me rephrase it like this, because we're talking about submission. Are there limits that employers have over their employees' submission? Can your employer make you and force you to submit to everything they say and do? No. There's limits. How about this one? I talked about it at the onset. Are there limits that your government, our government, has over us and our submission to them? There better be. (laughs) Are there limits on what parents can expect their kids to submit to them to? You bet. You bet. Is it okay to beat the snot out of your kids because they're unwilling to submit to you? That's not okay. So there are limits to the submission. I'm not going to get into all of them, ladies, but I will tell you this, that if, if your husband is beating you because you're not submitting to him, there are limits. First of all, he's broken the law. Second of all, you need to call the police. And third of all, you need to leave. I didn't say divorce. I said you need to leave. You need to separate. You need to get yourself out of there. So I'm not talking about, that's why I used the term punching bag, because I've had a woman come to me and say, he loves me. Yes, sometimes he punches me in the face, but he loves me. And with tears in my eyes, I say, that is not love. If he loved you, he would never strike you in the face or strike you anywhere or shame you or disrespect you. He is not loving you. So let's not take it right to the 10th degree, although I'm not afraid to go to the 10th degree. There are limits. But I'm going to back it down to like limit one or two because I think these are the more common limits. I'm not talking about the extreme. The point is is that we're all to submit completely to God and Him alone. It's not speaking of the wife submitting wholly and dealing everything she has to do to put up with this guy to submit to him. If you're doing that, you're actually sinning. You're committing idolatry. Because if you submit yourself to any authority above God, you're committing idolatry. If you're willing to submit more to your government than to God, then guess what? You're committing idolatry. Remember what Romans 6.16 says? Whomever you serve becomes your master. This is the picture here. So it's not saying, wives, submit to your husbands no matter what he's doing to you. Just take it and deal with it. No. There are limits. Here's the second interpretation, and this is where the limits become blurred. This is why I'm bringing it back down to two. Because these are usually the more common things that are happening in the marriage. It's not always abuse or the guy being a mongrel, though it is and does happen. But here's the second misinterpretation, and this one falls in favor of the wife. The man wants all authority, the man without Christ. That man wants to make sure that line is as much submission as he can get. Well, the wife generally, generally is looking the other direction. And so the wife interprets this scripture, not wives submit to your own husbands. They get that one, understand that. But it's the as unto the Lord part, just like the man gets confused with that part. You're to treat me like the Lord. Same way you treat God, treat me. Well, the wife says the same thing. She says, I only have to submit to my husband when he's doing things that God would do. Okay. Good luck with that one. In other words, the wife is saying, as long as he does 
always what the Lord wants, then I will submit to him. Let me bust your bubble, ladies. That's not submission. When you're agreeing with your husband, there's nothing to submit to. Submission comes and is required when there is a disagreement. And so the woman can define that, the wife, as unto the Lord, meaning it's defining a limit. I only have to be submissive as long as he's a good husband. As long as he's treating me like Christ loves the church, then I have to submit to him. That's not submission. In fact, Luke 6, 30, verses 30 through 37, Jesus says, what benefit is it to love those who love you? That's not love. Even the heathen do that. It's the same idea with submission. Uh, that's not submission when you are always telling your husband what you guys should be doing or this or that, and, and you agree with your husband, and that's not submission. Usually this submission is only required when there are extraordinary challenges. Because I don't know about you men, but I include my wife on what color we're going to paint the house. I include my wife on, hey, where do you want to go to dinner? Or what do you want to do with this? Or, hey, what do you want to do with this? Why? Because we're a unit, first of all. Because I care about my wife's input. Because I want my wife's input. Because I'm not just thinking about myself. I'm thinking about my family, the unit, the kids, my wife. So submission of the wife is only required when there is disagreements. That's what it's talking about here. It's not saying, you know, I want to go here and that's where we're going to go. I want to do that. That's, uh, nobody would live under those circumstances. The submission is talking about when there are disagreements because I don't care how closely knit you and your wife are. You're going to have differences. How much you're walking hand in hand and you love each other, it doesn't matter. There are going to be differences. There are going to be disagreements. So Paul is saying here, in lieu of that fact, in this unit, you may say the fault falls on the man. The default falls to the man. And the woman is to do what? To respect or submit to that husband's authority that has been given to him by God. And so the wife really, when she says, I only have to submit to him when he's acting just like God. The right wife is really saying, I will submit to my husband when I agree with him. That's not submission. Submission is only required again when there is a disagreement. So as unto the Lord does not describe the limits. Because you see how women can make their limits and men can make their limits. It's not speaking about limits. Just like I can make my limits on what I need to obey of my government. I can make those limits. God isn't talking about us making limits. He's not making limits. We make the limits. What God is saying is, look at the motivation. God cares about the motivation of submission. As unto the Lord means, I'm going to submit because I love God. Because God is commanding me to submit to Him. It's the motivation. I don't submit to my boss because my boss is a jerk. And I don't have a jerk boss. I'm just saying, last week, if you were here, you will understand that part. We don't submit to the authority because we like them. We uh, submit to that authority because of the position. I do all things as unto the Lord. The boss is the beneficiary of that. It's not me doing my work for them. It's me doing my work for the Lord. It's the same thing with submission in the marriage. So when the wife disagrees with the husband, God would say to the wife, submit yourself to your husband, in this disagreement, let him be the final say on it, the yes or no, with which that comes responsibility. Here's the problem. Men don't want the responsibility a lot of the times. So they defer it to the wife who, by nat nature, according to the word of God, wants that authority. Isn't that what God said in Genesis 2? After the fall... 
it said that the woman would desire the man. The position of the man. See, this is why submission not only cuts against the very grain of all of us as individuals, but especially this command to the wives. Because it's very unnatural for a woman to submit her will to a a man, her husband. It's very unnatural. That's why Paul said, as unto the Lord. You can do it for the Lord. We can submit to authorities because of the Lord. Because God is the one who blesses that submission. Because it's his order. And so don't put limits on it. In fact, I'll say as a Christian, what I find is those limits become less and less to what I am willing to submit to God. The more I love God, the closer I get to God, the more I understand that this is no longer my life, it's his. What do I care? Well, it's mine, it's mine. There's the problem. There's the problem. If we're valuing this life more than the life to come, then of course we're going to care about submitting and giving up our right to somebody else because it's mine. Well, my life is no longer mine. So then where is my limit of submission? Well, am I called to be a punching bag? No. But what happened to the first martyrs of the early church? If I remember right, they laid themselves down. They laid their lives down. They didn't deny Jesus Christ, and for that reason, they were executed. What was their limit to submission? I'll give you everything, God, until they put a knife to my neck. Then it's like, I'm going to deny you. Well, for the Christian, that's why I say it's all about submission. Now, where your line is, you know, you need to decide that for yourself. That line may be different depending on where you're at with your relationship with God. But just remember, whoever you submit yourself to becomes your master. It's not the person. If I'm submitting to the Lord, then he is my master. Is God a good master? He's a great master. He's a great master. He's a master that blesses me. He's the master that when I do things his way, he blesses my marriage. He blesses my wife. My wife gets a better husband out of the deal. (laughs) He blesses my kids who actually have an opportunity to flourish in this corrupt world. He blesses those around me because that's what God does when we submit ourselves to him, when we lay down our lives, when we lay down those lines. Some people are too busy making more lines. Well, you know, good luck. That was the point I was making last week. We have to be careful. And so what does it mean? Here's where we close. What does it mean for wives to submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord? Well, may I say this, that when a wife is doing what Paul says here and is submitting herself to her husband as unto the Lord, remember it's When there's disagreements, hear me on that. If your marriage is all about submission all the time, you got a problem. Your marriage should be blessed. You should be more anxious to do what your wife wants to do. Wives, you should be more anxious to do what your husbands do. That's a healthy marriage. If we're having to argue about submission here, there's a lot bigger problems in that marriage. (laughs) Guaranteed. Those are indicators. But when a wife is willing, it's a, it's a will, isn't it, ladies? It's a will. I'm not willing to do that. There you go. Don't do it. You're not going to do it. But when a woman is willing, a wife of her own husband is willing on a disagreement to submit herself to her husband's authority that had been given by God as unto the Lord, may I say that that woman's submission is an expression of her submission to the Lord. It's an expression, ladies. Not of how much your husband has his thumb on you. It's an expression. And if your husband has his thumb on you, again, this is so many layers. But a woman who is submitting herself to her husband as unto the Lord is one who is 
expressing her submission to the Lord. That's what it means is unto the Lord. You're doing it because you love God. And this is God's order in the marriage to better your part of the marriage too. Wives, you're submitting not just for your husband's sake. That's the part you have to understand. Because your husband, and I can speak as a husband, your husband isn't always going to make the right decision. And you say, ha, see, that's why I'm not going to submit to you, know, because you, sometimes you may. It's the husband's responsibility then. Now, if he's continually, continually wrong, then maybe you need to have harder conversations, right? If he's making bad, bad decisions, well, again, then maybe you need to seek some counseling or maybe some financial guidance or these sorts of things. If your husband's always, you know, blowing all the money out of the account or vice versa, I mean, there's so many layers of this. But wives, you're just simply submitting to your own husbands as unto the Lord for his sake. And wives, remember, the Lord has commanded this. And I'll say with all due respect, a wife cannot be submissive to God if she's a wife, married. A wife cannot be submissive to God without being submissive to her husband. Being submissive to God is being submissive to your husband, as unto the Lord. That's what Paul is saying here. So as you submit to God and his authority, you will do the same to your husband. And again, I'm not saying over all the smallest little details. If you're running around as a husband firing this, this verse off, you got problems. When there are serious decisions being made, where there's an impasse, I'll find that my wife and I agree on 99% of things. Genuinely agree. We find resolution 99% of the time. So this is the 1% I'm talking about here, ladies. Where it's detrimental, where it's this, where you're just at an impasse. You think about even in the military, there, there has to be somebody, right? There has to be the final authority. That's what God is saying here. When you're at this impasse and you're at this thing, it, it, the, the responsibility falls on the man. And a lot of men, sadly, we're going to talk to the men in two weeks, not next week. Eric Purdy is going to be teaching next week. But in two weeks, we're going to talk to the men because the problem I see a lot is men unwilling to take the responsibility to lead the home, to be the man, to take responsibility. Oh, it's easy as a man to take responsibility in the good things. But what about when the marriage is suffering? It's the man's responsibility. We're going to look at, in fact, we'll look at here in a minute, the woman is the glory of the man. In other words, the man is responsible for the woman. If your marriage is falling apart, God would look to the man, just like in Adam and Eve's case. So when men come to me complaining about their wives, <laughs> you're the problem. Well, wait a minute, you're the prop. Take the responsibility, man up. But we don't want to man up. It's just easier to agree with her and, and this and that, and, you know. And, and. You're out of order. You're out of order. You carry that same attitude into your workplace. Carry that same attitude before your government, right? I mean... Take responsibility, men. You're responsible. I'm responsible. Your wife is in bad shape. Look to the man. A wife's submission to her husband as unto the Lord is part of her Christian life. That's why I said, ladies, be careful who you choose to be your husband. When wives don't, Obey, I hate this word, but sorry. When wives don't obey this command, they aren't just failing in their marriage and falling short as a wife. They are following, falling short of their relationship with Christ as followers of Christ. That's heavy duty, right? 
And to your benefit, ladies, this is completely out of the realm, out of your natural desire. As I stated at the very beginning, all of us, men and women, it's very unnatural for us to submit to anything. Little kids, when they're babies, you ever see them all on the floor playing with a toy? Are they all being submissive to each other and saying, here, you take the toy. No, you take the toy. Please, you take the toy. No, what are they doing? Mine! We're all naturally just so unwilling to submit to anyone. It's our nature. But see, we have a new nature now in Christ. We've submitted to him. And so now all he's saying is, okay, now that you're Christians, here's the next step. Do you want to succeed? Do you want the family to flourish? Then here's the perfect model. Somebody has to be responsible. You can't just both throw your hands up and say, ah, you know, we're done. In fact, I'll even encourage that because I know this from personal experience. If your marriage is in a place where you're talking about divorce, it's the man's responsibility. And you're saying, well, I'm waiting for her to do it. No, you take the responsibility. I know that from experience. The man is accountable and will be accountable. And the sooner we accept that responsibility and act like men, probably the marriage will begin to do better. Definitely the kids will begin to do better. So women, it's not about submitting to your husband who is extremely intelligent. It's not about submitting to your husband's great giftedness or submitting to his compatibility. It's about honoring Jesus. I feel more for the ladies than the men because I know I can be just a, a dummy. That's why I need my helper, not my whipping post, not my submission tool. I need my helper. Let's not forget that, men. God said in the very beginning, it's not good for man to be alone, so let me make him a dominating factor and give him a slave woman to serve him. Wow, wait a minute. That's not what God said. It's not good for man to be alone. Let me create him a helper suitable See where I'm saying? I mean, if we're really having to debate this topic, it's an indication that there's turmoil in the marriage. If we're having trouble as Christians understanding wives submitting to husbands, husbands loving their wives, then those are indicators that maybe we need to seek some help. So ladies, again, be careful. I know there's some single ladies and my heart breaks for you. Some of you who've been divorced and maybe still have a desire to be married. That's not a bad desire. But be a little more selective on who you're choosing to be your husband. Don't go after the guy with the fancy car. Just for the fancy car. Just for the money. Just for his looks. Men, if you're single, same applies to you. There better be something more than physical attributes. Financial resources. So I'll close with this. It's a motivation. Here for the woman, also in two weeks for the man. Submitting to one another as unto the Lord, it's a motivation. This is what compels us. I'm not doing it because my husband, not me, I'm not a husband. Ladies don't do it to their husbands because he's God's greatest gift to the world. They're doing it because God is compelling them to do it. It's all about a Christian wife in this situation being concerned about pleasing Jesus. And may I say, I know this from experience too, a Christian wife will find great delight when she's being pleasing to the Lord. First Peter 3 said that at verse 1. First Peter 3 verse 1 says, In the same way, you wives... 
Be submissive to your own husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word. There you go, ladies. I only have to submit to him when he's acting just like God. Be careful, right? Because then those lines become just like the Jewish men who the divorce thing, right? What did they do? They said it got to the point where they allowed divorce and okayed divorce if the woman div- burnt the toast. Right? You didn't do this and that, so I'm going to divorce you. That's what it became. It became a mockery. And remember why God even allowed divorce in the beginning. It wasn't because you didn't like your husband or didn't like your wife or you guys stopped getting along. That's not why divorce was permitted. Divorce was permitted for two different circumstances. But at the end of the day, it's a result of the hardening of the heart. God says, I have permitted it under these two circumstances, adultery and abandonment. That's the lawful legal reason that God permitted for divorce. And why did he do it? Only because he knew that men and women would harden their hearts to the point where they would not submit to one another. So God said, under those two circumstances, fine, then you can divorce. But God hates divorce. And so the answer isn't, I'm not going to submit to him because he's acting like a jerk. Here, Peter says, submit your husbands even if they are disobedient to the word. They may be one without a word by the behavior of their wives. As they observe your chaste and respectful behavior, your adornment must not be merely external. Braiding the hair and wearing the gold jewelry, guys love that stuff, but it's more than that. Or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart. With the impressionable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God, For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God, there you go, used to adorn themselves being submissive to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed, whoo, man, obeyed Abraham, again, remember, respect, seeing him as the head, the authority at those disagreeing moments, calling him Lord, there you go. And you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. That tells me, women, it's not natural. Anytime we give ourselves to anyone, it's very fearful, isn't it? Giving up my will, that's why we're so afraid to give too much to the government because what's the fear? They're going to take it all! Which is true. So how about in the marriage? Can I then apply that same line to the marriage? I'm not going to give my wife too much because then she's going to want it all. How does that work in the marriage? (laughs) It doesn't. What did God say to the men? Love your wives only sometimes. Submit, you know, yourself to her only sometimes. No, he took it even a step further. He didn't just say respect your wife and submit to her. He said die for her. He said, sacrifice yourself for her. He didn't give the woman that command. So where's the line? Where's the line? Well, I believe a lot of Christians have that line blurred. I believe we make our own line. Well, again, the point of this message to me is, I don't believe God set the line. I don't believe according to this text, God is setting the line. God is saying your motivation for submitting yourself to anyone else needs to be me. Didn't Paul say, I do all things as unto the Lord? Didn't Paul say, I have been crucified with Christ? What does that mean? Does that mean I'm just half dead? I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. It's now Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. Where's the line in that? There is no line. See, the more we give of ourselves, guys, the less of ourselves we're going to have. What are you trying to accomplish, more of yourself or less? 
the more we give of ourselves, the more God, we're, we're opening up room for God to invade. The more if I give of myself, the more I am becoming like him, if he is my master. If you're submitting yourself to some other authority, then you are yielding yourself and making room, but you're taking on more of that authority that you're giving him the authority of. So the Bible says, be careful whom you submit yourself to. Like ladies here, you know, frightened by fear. Of course, it's a fearful thing. But is God one to be feared? He's one to be revered. But remember, 1 John says, perfect love, true love does what? Cast out fear. There is no fear in love because God is good. God is love. That's why it's so easy to submit to him because God is good and God is love. And what if submitting myself to God causes other men to hurt me and to, to destroy me and to tarnish me? Well, doesn't the Bible say something about um, don't fear those who can take the body? Don't fear those who can take your life. Fear God who can do what? Not just take your life, but he can cast your soul into hell. So who cares what man does to me? Again, I'm not trying, you know. Is that easy? No. But should that be the target? Because in reality, what is going to happen to all of us one day? What is going to happen to us all one day? One day, we're all going to close our eyes for the last time. That's a, a reality. So we have to submit ourselves to that reality. Who is the controller of that reality? Who is the controller of that destiny? It's God. I love what John the Baptist said when his disciples were kind of stirring him up a little bit. His disciples loved him. And they said, hey, John, Jesus, you know, your cousin, well, he's over there baptizing a bunch of people and, and they're all the people who are going to him and they're not coming to you. What are we going to do? We need to you know, get more people over here to baptize by us. What did John say? He said, I must decrease. He must increase. What is he saying? I must submit to his authority. Remember, John even said, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandal. I baptize with water. He baptized with the Holy Spirit. Fire. Submission. To one another. Then wives, to your own husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Children, obey your parents as unto the Lord. Slaves, obey your masters as unto the Lord. It's all about submission. Let's pray. Father, I just uh, whew, thank you for today, God. And I just ask ahead of time, Father, as I tremble, even trying to tackle topics like this, God. And your word is infinite. And here I am trying, a finite being, trying to interpret and understand your word. But I thank you for your spirit and I believe your insight into your word. I pray that your people would not see me or hear me, that they would hear you and hear your word. Lord, that all of us would submit to you. That we would give ourselves to you, holy. But Lord, I do pray, because I know this is difficult. I do pray for women who are in a bad situation. This message wasn't for them. If it was, hopefully it's a wake-up call to know what a real man of God is, a real husband of God. He's not abusive. He's not slandering. He's not unkind. In fact, he's going to love his wife like his own body. That's what love is. 
for the husbands, God, I pray that we would take the mantle. Take the mantle that you have made us responsible for, God. I, you know, I'm going to give an account. One day, I'm going to give an account to you, Jesus, for how I treated my wife. But Lord, let us assume and let us not be afraid to take responsibility. And usually we need to start by taking responsibility where we're falling short. Help us to be men that are worthy of our wives' respect. I'm not saying that the wife still shouldn't show the man respect, but uh, it's probably going to be easier for her to respect somebody that is respectable. Help us to remember we're a unit, we're a team. We're co-heirs in Christ Jesus. That's what a beautiful marriage is. Loving to please one another. In fact, I think a healthy marriage, a Christian marriage, is a submission competition. Husbands and wives want to compete to see who the head is. Well, here's a good idea. Get into a submission competition. Try to submit to each other more than the other. See how that marriage works out. Be a beautiful marriage. But God, we do thank you for the default, for the order. Because we will never see eye to eye, even though on 99% of the things, we're in agreement. But that 1%, God, you have designated the man and given him the accountability and the responsibility to be the decision maker. And so in that area, God, we ask that our wives would be patient with us. That our wives would be merciful towards us. Understanding the gravity of the responsibility. And, and maybe some women have assumed that responsibility because the man isn't doing that. Well, I pray, Father, that she would begin to encourage the man. That she would begin to yield some of that. Oh, Father, there's just so many different fragments. There's so many different situations. I can't cover it all here. But if you need help here today, if your marriage is struggling, please reach out. Because God has given marriage as a beautiful gift. And if it doesn't feel like a gift, then something is amiss. And usually it starts with order. Put God in the middle of that marriage. You want your marriage to be healed? Put God in the middle of it. Give God the mess. Just hand it to Him. Yield it to Him. Submit it to Him. And God will take it and He will begin to do things beyond your imagination. When we delight ourselves in God, He will give us the desires of our heart. So Father, bless each and every one, God, and forgive me, God. Forgive me for anything that I've said that is out of order. And please, Lord, bless that which was spoken of by you. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you so much for everything you've done. Go with us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Please stand. Our Father, we chart in
you. Thanks for joining us today. Go with God.